The affirmation for this is I trust in myself and in the wisdom that created me. Because when you learn to trust in yourself, what you're really doing is trusting in the very wisdom that created you. And this key word here is trust. The use of the word trust could be used synonymously with faith. This faith to move mountains, this faith to be able to create things for yourself without having that little smidgen of doubt in there. Remember, as it says in Proverbs in the Old Testament, as you think, so shall you be. Your thoughts, of course, create your reality. And the application of this is that if you're doubting, if you're thinking about even the littlest amount of doubt, then that will be what you will work on you will act upon that inner world of doubt and you will manifest the result of doubt and if you doubt something then obviously you know as Shakespeare said our doubts are our traitors William Blake had a wonderful line he said if the Sun and moon should ever doubt they would immediately go out so it's almost like you have to have the faith of the Sun and the moon that you are a divine being that has this divine intelligence within it. And as I talk about trust, it's appropriate to look at the characteristics of this uh, thing that has many names. The God Force, the Spirit, the Invisible Intelligence, the Soul, the Consciousness, the Awareness. Whatever name or label that we place on it, it has certain characteristics and it's a very this is a very tough area for us to master because our egos the part of us that are rooted in the physical domain really strongly believe in our separateness from each other and from God and because we are so attached to our separateness it is very hard for us to now begin to trust in a unity kind of consciousness a consciousness which says that I am much more than that which I observe. I am much more than my troubles. I am much more than that which I notice. As the noticer, I have this divine capacity. So what I'm talking about here is an intelligence or a God force or a divine awareness, whatever you want to call it, that is in all things in the tomato seed, it's in the banana seed, it's in you, it's in everything. Everything starts with an idea, and this idea is not in the physical domain. To come to trust in this really means that you have to transcend the ego part of you and say, I have got to learn as an individual, as a particularized part of this divine intelligence, I have to learn about and adopt an intelligence that doesn't know how to particularize. I have to adopt and be a part of an intelligence that is everywhere. That's what universal means. Universal intelligence means there is no place that it is not. Okay? Now, if there's no place that it is not, it means that it is in me. And if it is in me and there's no place that it is not, it is also in everything that I process or perceive to be missing from my life. It's also in that. So if I would like to be able to manifest abundance of some kind or a relationship or a healing or a seller for my home or a promotion or whatever it is, the intelligence that I am talking about, this universal divine organizing intelligence that is the highest part of, that represents the highest part of you, is in the very thing that is missing. So here's a key line to learn about learning to trust. When you learn to manifest, you are no doing nothing more than manifesting another aspect of yourself. You're manifesting another aspect of yourself. This intelligence doesn't know how to particularize, yet you have got to learn to adopt it and understand it from someone who is convinced that you are an individual who is particularized. You've got to do this with your ego, but yet you've got to transcend the very ego that you're doing it with. 
And when you do, the ego part of you says, wait a minute, if you get this, you don't need me anymore. <laughs> so I'm going to do everything I can to keep you from destroying the very thing that supports you. So this doubt will surface all the time. Here are the characteristics of the God force, of that force that's in that tomato plant. And it's like, you can practice this, you can, you can see it in, uh, in people. I remember one of the great teachers in my life was uh, Fritz Radl, who wrote a book called Controls from Within, and um, was a student uh, in Vienna. And he taught it uh, in the doctoral program at Wayne State University. And I was really blessed to be in one of his seminars. And I remember him uh, coming in one day to this uh, doctoral seminar. There were, I think there were six of us in the seminar. And he um, presented us with this story. He was just a great teacher. He never judged any of us. Uh, everybody, he already said, you're great, you've got an A. You're doctoral students, here's your grade, all right? Now, you can come if you want to come. You don't have to come if you don't want to come. It's up to you. I don't put any emphasis on it. If nobody's here, when I get here on Wednesday evenings, it was a three-hour seminar. He said, I'll just meditate. Yeah. And not one person ever missed a class. I don't think I ever worked harder in a seminar than I worked for this man. He, was, he, just, he wasn't doing what he was doing because he was attached to us doing it the way he thought we should do it. He wanted us to actualize ourselves. And he even said to us, self-actualizing people live from their divine self. They know the divine. And he said, imagine a person who's living at the highest level, who um, comes and shows up at a, uh, at a dinner party. And this dinner party, everyone is dressed in formal attire. Everybody has a suit on, not just a suit, but a black tie. And he said, this person shows up and he's wearing a pair of jeans and a baseball cap and a pair of sneakers and a t-shirt and he shows up at this gathering where everyone is dressed in formal attire he said the question is what would he do <laughs> and he walked out of the room he said I'll be back in 15 minutes now each one of us sat there and we wanted to prove how cool we were you know as a young doctoral student I was 27 years old and I had read this and I had read Maslow and uh, heard of Maslow doing these kind of things and I even had an opportunity to meet Dr. Maslow with, and to study with him, which was a great honor. So I wrote what I thought would be his reaction and each of the rest, the other five of us all did the same. And then he came in and he said, okay, well, Van, read your answer. And I read uh, what I had written down and each person read it. Most of us wrote something like... Uh, well, he wouldn't leave, and he wouldn't make a big issue of it, and he wouldn't pay attention to that, and, and he's not into appearances, and so he wouldn't be uh, concerned with whether the people liked it or not, and he would be independent of the good opinion of other people. I mean, I had it all down, right? And I gave all what I thought would be the right answers, how cool I would be. And each one of us read it, and then Fitz Radl said, uh, none of you got it. He said, the answer is very simple, three words. He wouldn't notice. Now, it shows you how far we have to go. He wouldn't notice. These are people. And this is a level of trust that I'm trying to get you to understand, which is one in which the unfolding of God is what is seen by this person in each one of us and in everything that he sees in the universe. They see the unfolding of God in each person. Not a physique, not a shape, not a color, not a sex, not an occupation, not a socioeconomic classification. None of those things. What they see is the unfolding of God in all things and in all people. And when you get to this place where you're beginning to trust in this wisdom that created you, you're beginning to understand what this force is like and how different it is from the ego, which is the part of us that has separated ourselves from that force and has believed in our own sense of particularization or individualization. 
Remember, to develop the kind of trust that I'm talking about, you have to be able to process this intellectual fact that there is an intelligence in the universe that doesn't know how to particularize. It doesn't know how to individualize. It has no preferences. It is everywhere at the same time. It has no judgment. It is like electricity. It's just there. It's everywhere and in everything. And being in everything, it's in you and everything that you would like to manifest. So what you're doing as you manifest is just getting another part of yourself to align. When you learn to manifest, what you're doing is you are aligning your intention with divine intelligence. You are aligning your intention with divine intelligence. You are not creating, you are not bringing something from another world into this world. We don't do that. Everything that's in the world is in the world. We just combine things and, uh, and we move things around that are already here. It's all here. The creative process is really nothing more than shifting around what is here already and aligning ourselves with it and redistributing it. And so the characteristics of this divine God force, if you will, is that it is everywhere, it is not particularized, it has no preferences, it has no judgment, it is always flowing, it never changes. And most important, it never dies. It never dies. When Lao Tzu, the writer of the Tao, five centuries before Christ, was asked the question, what is real, Master? What is real? His response was, that is real, which never changes. Somehow, you have to figure out a way to know the part of you that never changes. One of my favorite poems from a man who has influenced my life in a very big way, who lived back in the 13th century, named Mevlana Jalaluddin Rumi, was asked the question in this poem, where is he? I tried to find him on the Christian cross but he was not there. I went to the temple of the Hindus and to the old pagodas, but I could not find a trace of him anywhere. I searched on the mountains and in the valleys, but neither in the heights nor in the depths was I able to find him. I went to the Kaaba in Mecca, but he was not there either. I questioned the scholars and the philosophers but he was beyond their understanding. I then looked into my heart, and it was there where he dwelled. And I saw him. He was nowhere else to be found. He was nowhere else to be found. God, Allah, Krishna, the great Tao, the divine mind, the divine intelligence, it makes no difference what we call it. It is what we are. And when we live from that place, we find that the only thing that defines it is something called love. That when we have that within us, and that's the only thing that we have to give away. A great teacher in India many years ago, back 2300 years ago, named Patanjali, defined this kind of elevated consciousness. He said, when you are steadfast, and this is what I encourage for you, and this is the ladder that I have been climbing since I was a little boy in an orphanage, all the way up through all the writing that I have done and the raising of children, and here I am now at the age of 72, and got to the top of this ladder that was placed before me, that um, was put there so that I could escape from this world meaning I could escape from the illusion that this physical world is what defines me. 
If it is constantly changing, then it can't be real. It can't be. Because the minute that you say, that's real, and then you look at it and it's different, what is that? Is the 20-year-old body that I was in real, if it doesn't exist anymore? The invisibleness, the formlessness, the boundarylessness of who I am is what is real. And Patanjali said, when you are steadfast in your abstention of thoughts of harm directed towards yourself and others, that all living creatures will cease to feel fear in your presence. You can have that kind of elevated consciousness when you shift from the ego, whose mantra is, what's in it for me? How much can I get? How much can I make? How good am I going to look? How much power am I going to have? To the place when you get up higher and higher on that ladder, where the internal mantra says, how may I serve? How may I serve? How may I, how may I reach out and do something profound and beautiful for those around me? You are all the beneficiaries of a prophet named Sheikh Zayed. <laughs> a prophet who had within him that kind of awareness that I am not going to take the idea that I am better, bigger, stronger, more powerful because I have more. I'm going to take what has been given to me and I'm going to extend it to all of those around me. And as we begin to think in these ways, live from this level of consciousness, we shift and we find, as this final poem demonstrates, I am a poet, I write a lot of poetry, I've written a lot of poetry, studied it, taught it at the university. I always thought you would come to me in the shape of a beautiful lover. I never dreamed you would steal my heart with no shape at all. I always pretended I needed <clears throat> arms to hold me and lips to kiss away my pain. Yet I find fulfillment in the embrace of empty space. I always wished you would speak to me with words of tender sweetness but I know you whisper silently of your unending love. I always knew I would find you, although I foolishly looked with my eyes. You were here with me all along, hiding just outside and out of sight of my heart. It's within each and every one of us. Divine consciousness, divine love. Love has three <clears throat> faces. Human love is a love that changes and a love that varies. I love you a lot because you're so nice to me, but you weren't so nice to me now and you forgot to do this and you didn't do that, so I don't love you as much. And it varies. Sometimes I love you and sometimes I don't love you very much at all. That's what we call human love. Spiritual love is the love that you have for your children, that I have for my children who sit there with me here on this trip. It's a love that never changes. It doesn't matter what they do. It doesn't matter how bad they are. It doesn't matter whether they please me or don't please me. My love for them is infinite. But it varies. <laughs> It's stronger sometimes and not as strong as others. The love I'm asking you to consider is a love called divine love. And divine love is a love that never changes and never varies. It's a love that is just like the juice inside of that orange. No matter how you squeeze it, it makes no difference. The only thing that comes out is what's inside. And this interior part of you that we call the soul or the spirit, 
The way it is defined is that it is infinite. And infinite means it doesn't stop and it doesn't begin. It's birthless, it's deathless, and it's changeless. And it's who you are. Looking out in this illusion called your body, which an hour from now will be a different body, so which one is real? Your soul only wants to expand. Before I had children, I had eight theories about how to raise children. Now I have eight children and no theories. <laughs> but one of the things I know for sure about raising children is that nobody likes being told what to do because it's an insult to their soul. Their soul does not want to be compartmentalized. It does not want to be put into a box. It does not want to be told what its limitations are. Your spirit, your interiorness, the part that you can't get a hold of but you know is always there, that just, it's infinite, meaning it doesn't stop anywhere. And if it doesn't stop anywhere, it is always expanding. And the minute that anybody comes along and tries to restrict it, put it in a box, tell it what it can be and what it can't be, it's miserable. Don't allow anybody to put you in a box. Who you are is a divine piece of the source of God. And move in your life to a place where you understand it's who you are. Again, to close with my great teacher, Rumi, from the 13th century. You who seek God, apart, apart. That what you seek, thou art. Thou art. If you want to seek the beloved's face, polish the mirror and gaze into that space. Because in every moment of your life and mine, we have this choice. You can either be a host to God or a hostage to your ego. It's up to you. God bless you.